Hi, so yeah, I'm Marcus Cook. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to be talking to you today about how to put the customer first, um, primarily how to understand your customers better online. So this is me, Marcus Cook. I'm a director at Space Between. Um, I'm from Manchester in the UK, so that's the north, and that's why my accent isn't quite the Queen's English. Um, and I live in the south, so I'm a foreigner in my own country. It's always fun. Everyone talks very posh around me, and I do not. Um, I particularly enjoy skiing, so you'll find me in the French Alps quite often. Um, this is me. I'm an e-commerce consultant specializing in biometrics, user experience, conversion rate optimization, and UI. I like to make our customers more money. So if I can see a graph going up and to the right, then I know I've done a damn good job. Um, a statistic for you is we made our customers 2,400% more revenue in 2018. Um, this is us, symbol again, biometrics, user experience, conversion optimization, and then UI design. These are some of the people that we work with. What we tried to do is pick um, brands that you guys might know over here in the US. So p and Cruises, GHD, Hair Straighteners, Reese, a uh, high-end clothing brand, Evan Cycles, they make bicycles, ASOS, and Legoland. And we do various services for each of these clients. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is who your users are. Now, I know you've already heard about this, so I'm not going to lay on in detail, but I'm going to talk to you about some more specifics. Um, what do those people want? Because we need to define that to understand um, what they're trying to get from you and how you solve that problem. And then also, what problems do they encounter when they're trying to solve that problem through your services? How then can we fix those problems? And then how can we report on the success of those? Are the customers happier? Have we made more money? So, throughout this, I'm going to be referring to this uh, brand. It's going to be a fake brand that we make up, just so some of the talking points are a little bit easier. Um, it's a men's high street fashion brand. They have 50 stores. The business started 10 years ago, and they make about 80 million in revenue. Um, like I said, I'm going to refer to this at certain points, so it should help things make a little bit more sense. So, this is their ideal customer, or so they think. And we do this often with our clients, where we work with large enterprise um, customers, and they have product teams, and those product teams are often a few steps removed from the actual customer. And so we go in there, and we say, OK, do you know who your customer is? And they go, yes, our customer is a single young professional who likes to spend money on high-end fashion, high street. And I go, great, you're wrong. Um, because that is one aspect of your customer base. You know, Having a super simple idea of who your customer is is not always the right way to do. It's very simple, it's easy to understand, but it's not necessarily the actual real life scenario. So for the men's high street fashion brand, we have the top left who they think their customer is because they, they hear of these people all the time. Then potentially it's new to the high end fashion. You know, it might be a blue collar worker who is, has a date and they want to look smart. And so they're trying to essentially foray into this market for the first time. Then it might be a mother buying for their son because he has an interview and he's going to look trash otherwise. You know, she actually wants him to get a job and get out of the bloody house. Um, women shopping for a partner. So potentially um, a fairly new couple. She's going to introduce him to her parents and he doesn't dress very well, kind of like me. So you might want him to dress slightly up market as my wife does and buy nice clothes for him every now and again. And then lastly, new to your brand, but not to the market. So a shop with your competitors. Having a better idea of what these people are, what they want, the challenges that they face will help you design an experience that tailors to their needs. And often when we're coming up with these um, solutions to the problems, it's never a case of this is always going to be the best. It's a compromise between all these different needs. Um, Defining a digital customer, I'm not really going to labor on this, but essentially you have B2C and B2B, demographics such as age, gender, that kind of thing, psychographic, so beliefs, interests, behavioral, how they interact with your products, and then B2B, firmographics, so what does the company look like, size, location, number of physical stores, revenue, technographic, what kind of CRM system do they use, um, et cetera. When you're selling to business people, 
you still need to consider all the demographic, psychographic, and behavioral as well, because end of the day, we do sell to people. Those are your customers. And so it's just an extra layer you get with B2B. Um, when we have our users, we need to define what is our problem. What are they coming to you to solve? Um, what is their key motivation? So is it like the mother buying for the son where she doesn't want, she wants to get him out of the house essentially, so she wants him to look nice? Or is it a case of the blue collar worker who's looking for a new suit for maybe a, um, for a date or an interview? He doesn't, he doesn't want to essentially be embarrassed. And so when you understand what the motivation is, you can tailor the messaging a lot more specifically. What questions they might have in the process? So. If you're buying clothes online, you're going to want to know when it's going to be delivered to you. Um, you're going to want to know uh, how much is that delivery going to cost. So understanding what the pain points and the questions are and the right points in the customer journey will let you address those questions as they come up or potentially preempt them. What state of mind? So if you're at home on your couch in front of your laptop purchasing clothes, it's going to be a very different experience to if you're commuting on your on the phone you know, the Wi Fi is spotty, you're going in and out of tunnels. Understanding where your customers book, what times of day, and things like that will allow you to tailor the, tailor the experience. And what touch points? So, often when we work with brands, um, they go, You're a digital agency, why are you asking me about how the thing gets delivered? Because, whereas from my perspective, it's you want to know how the customers experience your brand at so many different levels. It's not just um, how did he purchase that product online, it's when did they get that confirmation, confirmation email to make them feel secure so they don't come back and talk to your customer support? It's how does the thing get presented to them when it gets delivered? Is it in nice packaging? That kind of thing as well. So it's a continuation of the brand and understanding uh, more about the user. So if we say we've defined the user's needs, so you can see here these people need to get from A to B and they will use any way, means, and possible. Um, and now we need to find the problems getting in their way. So we do that through a few different ways. We use two primary methods of research, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative is, like I'm doing now, people talking, surveys, questionnaires, or opinions. So it's generally the written or spoken word. And then quantitative is numbers, hard data, graphs. So stuff you might see in like analytics, that kind of thing. Um, one of the primary methods we use for qualitative research is user research. Um, what that is, is one-on-one -on -one moderated user research. Now, that sounds fancy, but what it is, is getting someone into a room, getting them to say, um, let's use a high street uh, clothing example. It's, can you buy a jacket online for me, please? And I'll watch you doing it over your shoulder. And that can look anywhere from... Um, this complex setup where you have a one-way mirror, people are essentially watching other people, it's creepy a little bit. Um, you can see monitors on either side, that is at the very high end, and um, this is what we generally do for our, our uh, customers. But what I'd encourage you to do, if you've never done it before, just get someone off the street, get them to purchase your product, watch them over the shoulder, because you'll get infinite amount of learnings as well, just from seeing how someone interacts with your product. Um, the first step is finding those people to come and be guinea pigs for you. Um, when we say representative, this is like we've mentioned earlier. It's all those people uh, that we mentioned. So the mother buying for the son. It's uh, your loyal customers. It's new to the brand, but not to the market. You need to understand who your customers are and then find um, representative users of that and make sure that if you're doing it for the first time, that it's widespread and that you're hitting lots of different demographics at once. What we recommend is when you're doing a usability study is you recruit somewhere between six and 12 people because you will generally find the majority of the questions there. The further you go from six onwards, you essentially have diminishing returns. So you're gonna be paying a lot more money for a very few learnings. The way I like to describe it to people is, imagine you're in a dark room, there's holes in the floor, and you've got these six, 12 people behind you, and you're pushing them into the room one by one, <laughs> most of the people are gonna fall down the first few holes. So the best way of doing it is grab those first six people, throw them into the room, break the legs, um, fix those holes as soon as possible, then grab another six people, and then throw them in, find the holes further on, further through the room, uh, and then repeat this process. 
Next, you need to be able to give them representative tasks to perform. And again, what that means is, like I said, if you're selling clothing online, it's find a jacket and go through this process and check out. Now, that is a terrible, terrible way of telling someone to do something because if someone will literally go through and go, okay, first jacket I see, and go. What you want to do is you want to set the scene. You want to get them in the right mindset. So when you first get them into the room, ask them questions. So build a rapport with them. Start asking them, how do you buy products online normally? What brands do you go with? You don't necessarily care about the answers. What you care about them is getting in the right frame of mind to complete this task that you want. So a better example would be, imagine you're going away on holiday. It's going to be cold. You've gone away with a family. And you're going to want to find something that fits your sense of style, aesthetic, and will also go with an outfit you already have in mind. And you're going to want to find something that doesn't shock you when you see the price. So these are all the kind of things that a user should be thinking about in part of this purchase journey. So you need to do the same. You need to set the scene so that they're right frame of mind and they don't literally just click through robotically, one, two, three, four, done. Thirdly, you need to shut up and let the users do the talking. This is difficult. Um, and it's going to be difficult because people don't want to talk to you. What you want from them is a raw stream of thought. You want their honest, unfiltered opinion uh, while they're still completing the tasks um, in a way that doesn't necessarily influence their behavior. Um, and to do that, you're going to have to prompt them. Uh, when you prompt them, you can say, what did you think about that thing? Did you like that jacket? You have to be careful with that, though, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But be ready to prompt these users, especially if they've never done any user testing before, because you don't often sit there with um, someone next to you while you're purchasing something and they just babble on and you know, essentially tell you exactly what they're thinking as they're going through. You'll have to apparently prompt them and ask them the right kind of questions. On asking the questions, you want to make sure you don't bias them. So, like I said earlier, did you like that jacket? Is not a good way of asking that. Did you find this feature frustrating to use? What do you think about that blue jacket? These are all leading questions. Um, the way you want to ask these is essentially um, what are you thinking? It's more prompting them for behavior. And it's not, when I say you know, leading questions, we don't really care about whether we're leading to one piece of clothing or another. What we care about is that we're influencing their behavior and they're not going to be in a natural environment. So we just need to be careful about how we talk to them and how we communicate to make sure that they're in as much as natural environment as possible and that they're not going to be influenced by the setting. So, how to not fuck it up. Um, don't ask questions that can be answered with a single word. Um, generally, people are difficult. So, for example, the report is here saying, how has success changed your life? And George says, yes. <laughs> people will be difficult. And so you need to essentially make sure you ask them more open-ended questions. Don't ask questions that can be answered by a single word. If someone does, then prompt them, try and change it slightly. Um, practice your questions beforehand. So get a colleague, get a friend, get a family member, member ask them these questions and see what responses they give you. Um, it's the quickest way of validating whether or not that's going to be a good question because if someone says, yes, I like it, then you know you should probably change the wording. Um, and third, get out of your poker face. So we talked about bias very briefly. Um, you can do that through explicit communication, you know, like I'm talking to you now, or through um, natural body language. So if I go, yes, 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 lean in, nod, they're going to want to tell me more about that kind of thing. So you have to be a bit more robotic. Um, you can't be like, oh, shocked. You can't do angry faces. You can do none of that. You just need to essentially give them the bare minimum so they can continue talking through the raw stream of thought. Um, next step is surveys. So. Again, your marketers, you probably well know about Net Promoter Score. Hands up, who knows about NPS? Good. Very briefly, for those of you who don't, um, it's a single question. Would you recommend this experience product um, service to a friend or a colleague? You need to get super high uh, response from this for it to be considered uh, that they would. So like a 9 or a 10, uh, anything below and including 6 is going to be a detractor. 7 and 8 is neutral. Um, we like to ask this at the end, so we go through the user testing, 
Um, so we got them through, say, a product. So they bought that product now, and I go, okay, so I'm going to ask you some questions. The first one is net promoter score, just to figure out kind of what they thought. The second one is the system usability score. Now, this is a framework for asking uh, questions about um, software, and it's it was made in the 80s, so the language can be a little bit uh, verbose, let's say. Um, there's about eight questions, and the questions essentially range from anything like, um, did you find this experience cumbersome? Uh, what I'd say is it's fantastic because it's had so much use. It's been used in thousands and thousands of studies. There's quite a few white papers on it, you know, in the number in the hundreds, and that essentially tell you how you can use this. Um, but don't be afraid to take out questions. So, did you find the experience cumbersome? We found recently in a user study, we were testing a uh, online food retailer, and I'll talk about them in a little bit. But there's a lady there who uh, wasn't, wasn't very old, you know, had two children, she didn't know what the word cumbersome meant, so in a room full of people, she had, then she had to admit that to me. And that was a, I didn't have to put her in that situation, that was on me. You can change the word, wording, because it is, you know, from the 80s, it is more scientifically minded. Make it, make it uh, more relatable. Use the word difficult, right? Um, that's fine. And you can also drop out a question if it particularly offends you as well. Um, but in general, it is a, it is a damn good um, piece of kit. Next step, biometrics. So this is where we take the qualitative aspect of the one-on-one -on -one moderated user research and we layer on extra pieces of data. So why do we do it? We do it because we want to find out more about the user's motivation. So when someone purchases a jacket or chooses which jacket to purchase, we want to understand more about that. So if you think of user motivation as a pie chart, as I like to because everything is better in a graph, um, you can see the do I remember it? And this is from essentially if you ask the person, you know, why did you do that? You know, they, can, they can tell you whether or not they remembered that particular product. But they can't tell you all this other stuff. So did it, did it make me smile? Did it connect with me on an emotional level? Did I notice the key information about that product? Am I motivated to act? As in, um, is it appealing to some center of my brain? Uh, and then there's always going to be some unexplainable portion. It might be you're trying to sell someone bananas. And they were super ill, you know, massively hungover a couple of years ago and ate a banana and then threw up immediately afterwards. And they will never eat another banana again. You're not going to know that until you prod in. But that's fine. We, we're just getting more of the kind of decision making. So the way I'd like to explain this is that if you see conscious behavior and unconscious behavior as a spectrum or an iceberg, um, you have the bit above the top of the water, which we can always see and we can understand, which is the self-reported stuff. So the surveys out the back of a um, user research session or focus groups. These are the stuff that people would tell you. And realistically, you can get that first segment of the pie chart with that. Do I remember it? You know, did it, did, is it um, something that is within, is within my memory? And one thing I'll say is that people will lie to you. And they won't do it maliciously. It's just that they don't know any better. You go through an hour of questions and doing these surveys, you're going to forget a hell of a lot of stuff. Um, so understanding more about that is important. So as we go down, we can see facial expressions. Did it make me smile? As in, did I have a physiological response on my face to it? It could be smile, anger, any kind of thing. Skin conductance. So I'm going to talk about this further. But essentially, there are stimuli which will make you um, present certain conditions. So if you heard about like a polygraph test or a, a lie detecting test, if you're asked, asked awkward questions, your body will have a response that you cannot control. Or you can if you've been specifically trained to, but the vast majority of us aren't massive psychopaths, so we can't do that. Um, eye tracking. Looking, did I notice key information? So, for example, if you're, like I was talking about delivery information before, did I notice the key delivery information when it made sense to me? And then EEG, which is electroencephalograms. And now, you might have seen this before, it's like caps on heads. Uh, I'll talk about that before, but that essentially measures different brainwave patterns, and you can understand which segments of the brain are firing at which times. And when you're going through a website, you can understand how the user, the user is motivated to act at certain points throughout that process. So this is an example biometrics. So you can see we have um, the sensors on the left with all the graphs coming out of it. Um, on the right is a participant. You can see she's got an EEG cap on. She has a scene camera pointing down at the mobile device there, and we, we test any number of devices. So 
what we normally do is we normally do mobile because we like to test on the worst experience possible. Um, and often, as much as people are spouting mobile first, no one is actually doing it at a sufficient level unless you're a big enterprise company. And even then, there's oversights. Eye tracker, so seeing where people see in the screen, should just give you an idea of exactly how this plays out. So, eye tracking. This is uh, a small piece of kit that sits at the bottom of the screens. Um, it looks like this in situ, so it's relatively unobtrusive. Um, what it actually does is shine a light, an infrared light that you can't see onto your cornea, checks the reflection, uh, and it understands where your eyes are looking on that. The accuracy is about, if you look at your thumbnail, it's about that much. So on a, a laptop or a screen or a mobile screen, it's fairly accurate, which is quite nice. Um, the second way of doing it is glasses. Now, we don't generally use these, but they're great for our applications, like real-world applications. So say, for example, if you're driving a car and you want to see if this uh, driver saw the pedestrian crossing the road, or if you're walking around a supermarket and you want to compare brands of cereals, um, these are great for it because you can see exactly where someone's looking, how long they spend looking at that brand of cereal comparably to others, and which parts of the box draw their attention. Is it the big smiley cat face, or is it the text and the, the shiny cereal? Um, this is essentially the screen reader, one that we saw before, the one that sits at the bottom. It projects like a 3D uh, box in space, and you can essentially detect um, where someone's looking as long as their head is situated in this position. Um, it uses various different bits and pieces, you know, image processing algorithms and all that cool stuff. Um, what that looks like, I don't think this video is going to play, but what it does look like is um, on the right, you can see uh, the website that we were testing, and you can see the candidate on the left. You, what you'll find is as people read through websites, you might think it's very linear, so left to right, down a line, left to right, down a line. It's not. It's very sporadic. It's all over the place. People's eyes juttering up and down. Um, we've done tests on email campaigns, uh, and what we found is that if you put any kind of content in a large paragraph, no one will read it. They'll very try and skim it initially, and then they'll get bored and move on. Um, bullet points work so much better because people can skim read through that quite easily. Um, this is the data that comes out the back of it. So we get heat maps. Now, you might have seen heat maps before from tools like Session Cam, Hotjar, Crazy Egg, that kind of thing. Those all do mouse tracking. This is based on the actual eyes. So this is a test we did with ASOS, and you can see on the left-hand side, their thumbnails, on the middle there's a product imagery, and then on the right is the product meta and the anti-cart. What you'll see here as well, potentially if you have great eyes, um, is TTFF, and that's time to first fixation. So you can see on the uh, product imagery, in general, it took people 2.9 seconds for the page from the page loading to actually looking at the product imagery. And this is great because now we can break down the page and go, okay, so most people Look at the product imagery first, and then the thumbnails, and then the price, um, which lets us optimize the page in various different ways. So we know if people are looking for more product imagery, then we can make that more apparent and easier to look at. Um, as well is if we have key product information, like delivery information, and we're noticing that people aren't looking at it, and we, if people are asking us for this information at this point, then we need to move it into one of the high traffic areas. Um, the next bit is it looks like a crazy person's map because there's so many boxes here, but we can essentially break down the page on a, on a per um, element level and say we can get the time to first fixation, the time spent, how many people look at that thing, how many people come back to it, how many times they come back to it. They have a fix, how many fixations as well. So you might have a gaze where you're kind of looking across the room and then you might have a fixation where someone's looking directly at you. And so it's important to understand the difference because if someone's looking across, then it's a case of the scanning, looking for the right information, and the fixation is my intent to read this thing. And then how many mouse clicks as well. So we take this, and this is where the, the more um, quantitative aspect comes in. So you can see the blue bar, which is the time to fixation, and then these are the elements on the page, and you can see how people move through these elements looking at various different bits. Um, the orange bar is the time spent as well. So you can see they look first at the product image, for the most amount of time, and then they look at the, the video button next for a, for a small amount of time, size, thumbnails, etc. Eye tracking versus mouse tracking, like I talk, talked about earlier, you have tools like Session Cam, 
mass flow, that kind of thing, where you can see the user session. Now, we did a bit of research on this, and what we found is that there are essentially three types of users. The first type, move the mouse out of the way so they can read the screen. Mouse tracking is not very good for that at all. Um, the second type will follow along slowly, and it will follow the eyes about one to five seconds afterwards, and so they'll skim read over it. For those people, it can be relevant, but it's out of date. And then you do have the third set where people follow it very intently and move it through. Um, so one thing I will say to you is if you're looking at mouse tracking data from your analytics tools, you want to be careful. Take it with a pinch of salt. It's not going to be what the user's actually looking at. It's more going to be potentially small interest areas. So you might not see the ancillary information that people are reading, but you're not seeing that they're actually paying attention to it. So it can lead you down the wrong rabbit hole if you used incorrectly. Um, next bit is galvanic skin response. And I talked about this. It's kind of like a polygraph. I say it's two thirds of a lie detector test. What it looks like is, you can see the white box there. It's two electrodes on the skin. Sounds scary, promise you it's not. <laughs> it sits on the bottom part of the hand and it passes a small electric current between them. That resistance of that current changes depending on how much you're sweating. Now it's not like oodles of sweat, right? It's not like your hands are dripping. It's more small micro changes. So an example is if you despise cats or you like cats, and I show you a picture of a cat within one to, five, one to five seconds, your body will have a physiological response that you can't control unless you've been trained to, which most of us can't, um, which is great to understand if we're looking through different product imagery sets and someone has a spike when they're looking at a specific particular jacket, then you know that's the right one for them. Um, this is what it looks like in situ. So straps at the wrist. Now, if you're telling people that you're going to come into a lab, you're going to sit down with strange people and they're going to strap electrodes to you, people get worried, um, especially so if, uh, so there's two places you can put these. You can put them on the hands because there's the most sweat glands in the hands and then the feet. But if you ask someone to come into a room and strap electrodes to the feet, it's not going to go very well. So we use the hands. Um, we attach it to the wrist. So it kind of feels like a wristwatch. Um, what you'll find is that people get worried when we first do this because they're like, oh, this is weird. I don't know how we have things on my hand like this. Um, so what I do is I get them into a room and then I do this immediately, strap it into them, tell them what it's all about, explain that it's not going to shock them. You're not going to be able to feel anything. It's fine. It's going to feel like a rich wristwatch and a couple of rings. And then after about five minutes of me waffling on, uh, they forget that it's there and it's, it becomes very day-to-day. -day. This is the data that you get out of the back of it. So the... Top section is a raw graph, and there's two components to this. So you've got the, the big bit that you see, which is essentially we all have this, and it changes over time how much we're sweating. Uh, and it generally depends on stress levels, like mine now, very high, or food, how hungry you are, how hot you are. We don't really care about these kind of things because they're super long variables. We're not really going to control for them. What we care about is the small spikes. Now, if you see the bottom one, those, this, we run it through a peak detection algorithm to see where those spikes are. And what we found here, this is me actually playing a computer game, and you can see the big drop-offs are where I die and get upset. Um, what you can see here is the small peaks as well, and these are small specific stimuli that I've been um, essentially shown by the game, and then I've had a response to. And there's a few ways we look at this. One is, like I've said before, if I show you a picture of a coat and it spikes, then you probably either hate or love that coat. The other thing is, we often do competitor research. So we'll find like-for-like -like competitors, say, two food supermarkets, and we'll check out their payment page. And then we can conclusively say that one payment page has more, unless it's more emotional response than another one. And obviously, when you're paying for something, you don't necessarily want people to feel um, stressed or anxious or that kind of thing. And so we can cl conclusively say from this data that one is better than the other. And then we can dig in further into that and go, okay, so across this timeline, why were we getting those peaks at this particular point? Which, about, which thing about the payment page did we not like? Um, facial expression analysis. So thank you to my two wonderful models here, Maggie and John. Um, this is essentially a webcam that sits on the screen. Um, it records people's faces and it maps those faces to various different points. So you can see now, potentially, there's white dots on, say, the eyebrows, around the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the chin. 
we take about 30 pictures every second and then we see how those dots change. How those dots change um, relate to emotions or expressions. So mouth open, eyebrows up, that kind of thing. What this is, is a trained eye model. Um, it's trained on 7.5 million faces in 87 different countries. It's split equally between the east and the west of the world. So it does account for some cultural differences. Obviously, some people um, display different emotions differently. So like uh, joy, say for example. What we then do is take those expressions, the mouth open, the brows raised, brows furrow, that kind of thing, and then map them to different emotions. So joy. He's very happy, isn't he? Anger. The savage. Surprise. Um, fear, contempt, sadness, and disgust. Um, generally, we can break them down on a per emotional basis, but what I really care about is whether or not someone's having a bad time or a good time. I don't necessarily care about the difference between fear and contempt when it comes to a website or a product. If it's a negative experience, let's optimize out of it as quick as possible. So, the last bit is the scariest. Um, it's uh, essentially electroencephalograms. These are caps that sit on your head. I don't know if anyone's seen these. You might have seen them on science TV programs, that kind of thing. What it is, is a cap full of electrodes. But to apply these things, you essentially have to scratch away at the scalp, and then you have to apply a gel onto the scalp on each different site. It's not a painful scratch, but you know, you don't want to have your head scratched by a random person. Um, so we tend not to do this, because as much as I don't like to attach the electrodes on the GSR, telling someone I'm going to scratch their head with a pen and then apply a gel to their head, especially when they've just done their hair, is not going to go down very well. Um, but it is handy if you do do it, uh, because it can detect cognitive and motivational processes. Um, these are the kind of things you can get out of it. So engagement or boredom over the time, frustration, motivation, excitement. So these are the underlying processes that um, essentially govern why we act. And it's essentially electrical activity in the brain. Um, I spoke about a, uh, a food establishment earlier. So this is Waitrose. They're essentially the UK's whole food. So it's kind of high-end uh, grocery shopping. Um, that picture looks terrible, and I'm very sorry. So I'm going to describe it with my words instead. Um, what it is, Waitrose have a fantastic website. It's well optimized for mobile. You can add products. You can do multi-search. Um, we ran a test on this. People loved it on the mobile. And then they got to the checkout section. So they added about $80, $80 worth of goods, uh, various different products, had a fantastic time. And then they were dumped into this horrific thing on a mobile, which is a desktop site presented on a mobile with different colors for the buttons, different logos, different layouts. I actually got an error as well when I was doing this, so it's not a very good website. Um, why the hell did they do this to users? I'm not sure. Probably because they've not built this section yet nicely. Um, but what we found was that Users, this is a system user, usability score that we talked about earlier, and this is Waitrose and two other brands. So the bigger the bar, the better they did. Waitrose did the worst. And they did the worst because after that, after that experience, users were telling us it was terrible. They hated it. Um, and I thought that was a little bit strange because 80% of the website was pretty damn good. So if you look at the average emotion type, so green is good, red is bad. Waitrose had the most positive emotion throughout the entire process, but they were reported as being the worst. What this is, is the journey. So the top section is shopping, registration, a bit more shopping, summary basket, checkout, and then the payment. What you'll see is the last two points are red. They're very red. The other ones, uh, the rest of it, the other 80% is mostly green. There's a couple of red and orange scattered in there, but in general, an aggregate is a good experience. The last two stages influenced their result for the system usability scale. And this is why I'm saying you can't necessarily trust the users because they're not gonna tell you the truth they're not going to tell you the objective truth. They're going to tell you your, their truth. Um, and so with the various different sensors and other data we had, we can understand that there is value in this site, but it's generally in that first 80%. And so we can take the learnings from that. So again, I guess the takeaway of this is that negativity bias, as humans, um, we're more inclined to focus on the negative aspects, especially even if you know uh, we have a positive experience and that's potentially greater. We're just awful creatures, unfortunately. <laughs> so one thing I'd say to you is, when you're doing this kind of research, just be aware that as humans, we do focus on this, and you need to account for that ever so slightly. Um, next step is quantitative analytics. So 
in this, we do all the normal stuff that you would find. Um, I'm not going to go into it too in, de in depth because you, you guys probably know this, but what we generally do is funnel dropouts. So identify the core customer journeys, uh, find the dropouts at each stage, and this was going to help you prioritize which areas to work on first. So in this example, in our high-end e-commerce store, there's 80% of people that hit the cart page and then dropping out. So there's definitely a problem there. Uh, we, need to, we need to look at this. Um, we can do technical tracking analytics. So you need to click into a field, click into an object, find how long it takes to complete that field, and then also scroll depth. You need to add these things to your website so you can properly understand how people are interacting with your products and your websites. Um, it's not just good enough to do the normal Google Analytics e-commerce suite. You need uh, much better, more in-depth tracking. And this will essentially help you optimize pages, not just we know there's a problem with this page. We can then dig into, okay, so we know that 30% of users are getting stuck on this field. It's taken X long to essentially um, tell us their date of birth. Why is it taking them a minute and a half to tell us the date of birth? Potentially because something is broke. Scroll depth, how far people are getting through the page. Um, other things you can do, so I talked about session camera earlier. Session recording, this is a bit creepy because people don't know what's going on. It's going to be hidden deep in a cookie policy somewhere, but you can see exactly what your users are doing on your website. Um, this is great for actually following a person through, and you can, they do things like struggle, so you can see the customer journeys with the most struggle and then optimize for them. Mass tracking, like I said, take it with a pinch of salt. It does have its place. It can be useful as long as you take in the previous considerations. Session Cam does this as well. Um, Website errors. If you have a tool that collects all your website errors, like your JavaScript errors, um, your usability errors, you can fix those things super quickly, generally. It's a low-hanging fruit. That's the first thing that we do, um, because we can get in there, fix those things straight away, and immediately you get uplift. Um, next thing is an expert audit. So get someone who is embedded in the industry, who has spent plenty of time in there, to essentially look at things like your site usability, um, your accessibility, you know. Um, there's plenty of different um, standards out there that which you should adhere to, so making sure you're hitting these things as well, especially from an accessibility standpoint. If you look at, um, like, even color blindness, and as, as an example, there are essentially about 25% of the population has some form of color blindness. If you're um, not properly catering for those users, i.e. your buttons don't have the same contrast they, sh they should do, your people can't distinguish your primary call to actions from your secondary call to actions, you've got something wrong. Um, information architecture, conversion, user flows, that kind of thing. Um, this is a shameless self-promotion. Here's a free audit for anyone. If you come talk to us afterwards, uh, I'm English, uh, I despise this, I'm sorry. Um, come find us, have a chat, and we can talk about how to get you a free audit and how to help you optimize your websites. Um, Moved on very quick, you see that. Uh, prioritizing the problems now. So we we kind of know what the problems are, but now we need to figure out exactly which order we should fix them. And we do that in a few ways. So let's take the high-end fashion retailer that we saw before. We have, this is a very simple journey flow, but imagine homepage, category, product, cart, checkout, payment. We know there's issues on the product, cart, and payment pages. How do we focus on which one to solve first? So. This is the discrete data points we have for each of these. And this is why we use the biometrics, because then we have a much better um, confidence in the decisions that we, we will make. So on the product, we know that analytics is telling us there's a dropout there. On the cart page, we have analytics is telling us a dropout. A user has told us there's a problem. And also the UX audit has highlighted that there's a usability issue here. And then the payment page, we know analytics is a self-reported issue we have someone found when they got to this point, or there's a significant amount of negative emotion here. We had significant numbers of GSR peaks in this section, which again, we don't want, because we don't want people stressed when they're trying to give you the card information. And then we found UX issues as well throughout the audit. So we know what the problems are, now we need to solve them. <laughs> um, these are generally the order that I would look to I'd go through to solve these things. So best practice, right? Um, what does the industry recommend? Now, there's a lot of different ways you can source this kind of thing, especially if you're new to it. So Google recently released internal playbooks for various different vertical sectors of how you should solve um, common usability problems, such as like search for news on large content sites. Have a look at those things. They do a pretty damn good job of showing you different case studies. Or sites like GoodUI, who have um, tested 
different examples of different problems and solutions to do it, and I'll talk about those if I've got time later on. Competitor solutions, take these with a pinch of salt because they're not always going to apply to your particular market. There might be slight differences, but you know if someone's had a particular um, way of generating leads throughout their website, have a look at that, go through it, you can steal it, it's okay. User suggestions, so actually what the users are telling you, and then you can have internal business suggestions as well, so pick and choose out of them. Um, one thing we like to do is, coming up with the ideas is very difficult, because you can literally pick and choose from thousands. Um, this is what we call a strategy map, and we do this to make sure we're not letting any ideas go, and so we're, every now and again you'll get to a point with your CRO optimization program and you hit a plateau. If you have something like this, it can remind you to try and use different tactics. So at the top we have cart checkout rate. So with this, um, we have different strategies that can, we can apply to essentially improve the cart checkout rate. So simplifying decision making or reducing steps in the checkout or personalization. So let's take simplifying decision making and then underneath that we have three tactics. Addressing questions and concerns. So a question or concern might be, like I've banged on about before, the delivery information. If someone has a question about delivery information, at that point you need to make sure you address that concern as soon as possible. Or reducing the project pressure of the decision. So if you have payment methods like Klarna, say for example, where you can buy now, pay later, that essentially takes the pressure away and they're not going to feel as, um, as worried about making that purchase. So we're going to pick these three areas. So addressing questions and concerns, reducing the pressure, and skipping up sales to try and solve this cart checkout rate problem. These are the tactics. So there's various different ways we can address questions and concerns. So a concern might be, I'm worried about the credibility of this website. So we can add messaging about website security. We can talk about review and trust information. So X many people have uh, bought this product and loved it. Or buy now for next day delivery, that kind of thing. Reduce impressive decision. So payment methods like Klarna or add mess messaging about free returns if you offer it. Put it in the right place. Skipping up sales, remove the upsell stage or make the skip button more prominent. I wish waiters had done that because they wouldn't have had such a terrible response from the users there. So we've got our ideas. Now we need to figure out exactly how do we decide which ones to roll with. Um, so this is a hypothesis. The basic example is if I do this, then this will happen. A better example is if I do this, then this will happen because of this thing. So by increasing the primary call to action contrast, then we expect to make more money because it was easier to distinguish. This is a good way of laying out your ideas. It's good to communicate with the business. It's easy, it's understandable. Um, gives everyone the same framework to work with. There's still one thing terrible about this hypothesis. It's the make more money section. Choosing what metrics to use, I could give a whole um, talk on this in itself. What I'll say to you is, you wanna use metrics that you have lots of high volume in, not always necessarily revenue, um, Often, from a business standpoint, you're going to want to use revenue, but you're going to have very, you're going to struggle to get any kind of significance on those tests at any speed. So, pick metrics that are close to the test, um, and then you should also make those metrics tied to business goals, um, so that you can communicate what you're doing and why you're doing it to the wider business. So, a better example is by increasing the primary call to actions contrast, then we can expect to see a higher percentage of users interacting with the button because it is easier to distinguish. Um, these are some examples of hypothesis. I'm going to move through these fairly quickly. Um, this is what we talked about earlier. So at this point, you're happily running your CRO program. You're, you've got your test, you're ready to prioritize. Um, but then all of a sudden, a hippo crawls into that. Now, a hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. So what I'm using this for is it's not always your decision. It's often you have someone in the business trying to take down to you what you should work on. Um, what I'll say is that's not always a bad thing, but you need to know how to manage that and there's certain ways that you can um, prioritize these tests to make sure that uh, you do so um, because it's not always a nice, cute, happy hippo. Sometimes it's an angry, growling one. Um, the other reason is you need to fix the user's pain quicker. So if you're essentially making sure you have the right prioritization framework, you will fix the user's pain quicker and you'll make more money. And it's not always like little bits of money. Um, it can be significant amounts of money that you can swim in. Um, okay, but how? 
There's lots of different frameworks. Essentially, they always come down to confidence, impact, and ease. Um, confidence is, are we sure this is an issue? How many data streams have reported this issue? Impact is, how much pain are we solving? Is it a high traffic area? What will the return on investment be? Ease, how long will this take to design and build? And do I need to expend political capital to do this? Or does the business need, need time to research and invest? Um, every framework essentially implements those things in some way. So you have the simple from the pie in the ice framework to the more complex. Um, what I'd say is if you're just starting out on this kind of thing, if you're doing a test and learn program for the first time, go simple. If you're going complex and you've got significant numbers of hippos, then complex is the way to go um, because it's objective. Because um, multi lots of us, everyone in this room with a good prioritization framework should be able to rate things in the same way. Um, an example would be, uh, does this experiment take place on a page with more than 100,000 views per month? Yes, then it gets a point. A bad example of this would be, um, does this exist on a high traffic page? You need to have a metric that you can agree on as a business and all move forward with. Other examples like, are we adding or removing an element because traditionally that will impact the conversion rate? If it's going to be more of a significant change, is it above the fold, etc.? These are our tests rated now. So ad messaging about website security is the highest because it is, we have significant confidence in it. I.e., We've got lots of data points that support it. The impact is so-so because it's quite small, but it's very easy to do. So with those things, this is why it's rated so highly. Um, now we need to fix the problems, and we do this with conversion rate optimization. So it's essentially a framework to increase the likelihood that users will complete a desired goal, i.e. a purchase or uh, like a, a B2B lead. Um, there's a few different ways of doing this. So you guys have probably seen this before. Split testing, give 50% of the traffic to one variant, i.e. the blue button, another 50% to the other variant, i.e. a red button. Um, now, question for you guys. You might not be able to see this here, but I'll describe it to you. It's essentially the same page. Um, on the one on the left, the call to action for each job, so it's essentially a job board where you can apply and read, read about jobs, says, read and apply. The one on the bottom right says apply for a job. Now, hands up who thinks the first one, read and apply, will be successful. Good, you're very brave. Um, and the second one, apply for a job, who thinks that will be successful? Okay, so you are right. Good job. Um, everyone else, sorry, no, you're wrong. And I was wrong on this one as well. The reason uh, we're all wrong is because more people chose the read details and apply, and it's the best way to make business decisions. You're actually getting the users to tell you what they want. Um, it's always hard to essentially understand why something particularly won. You can kind of intuit it, but it's difficult. The reason why I think read details and apply one is because essentially the apply for job. People might not be ready to apply for the job yet. They might just want to know more about it. Um, and so that's why the first call to action is better because it gives a more accurate understanding of what the user can do on that next page. Um, next step is multivariate testing. Uh, essentially, you define multiple different sections of the website, and then you can have multiple variants in each of those sections. So you might have a header section or a hero element with two variations, and you might have a um, like an Im image on the right-hand side with three different variants, and then you try different variant, different combinations of those variants to see which one will win. So this is great if you're trying to optimize like a high-traffic landing page, and you want to try completely different brand messaging or theming. Um, this is on the same site, an example that we did. Um, on this, we changed 54 different elements of these pages um, with 1,000 plus combinations of the variants. And we took the conversion rate from this page from 7% to 18%. By doing this on a high traffic pages, you can have a significant uplift and it lets you test lots of different ideas at once. So if you're a more mature organization, you've got lots of ideas, it's a good way of going. Um, this is a core experiment loop. I like to call this a flywheel because it should be feeding back into itself, building momentum, and so that you're essentially making better decisions and you're getting more business impact as you move through this. So hypothesis design, i.e. UI design, prototyping stage, communicating that throughout the business, making sure there's buy-in, building it, actual front-end development, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Make sure you test it. Make sure it goes through the same testing procedures as the rest of your website. Um, put it live. 
And then the analysis stage. Now, there's lots of different ways of analyzing tests. You can use like Bayesian methodology or two-sided z-tests. You know, or even Optimizer has their own stat engine, and there's a white paper on it if you care to read uh, or fall asleep. Um, what I say to you is, there's lots of tools out there that, that do these kind of analysis for you. When you start that and getting out, use those tools. But there comes a point when you need to dig in deep and you need to understand what they're doing behind the scenes because you can read the same test with two different methodologies as a winner and a loser. So make sure that you um, read into that once you're at a level where you feel comfortable. Um, what happens when your test wins? Well, winning is easy. Everyone loves it. The business is going to be very happy with you because you just made the money. Easy. But inevitably, experiments fail. And about 50% of experiments will fail. Um, don't panic. It's fine. Failed experiments are bullets dodged. And by that, I mean, if you're testing business ideas and you implemented one of their tests, it fails, then you're essentially getting yourself out of a negative ROI situation. You just implemented that from the business and it, you know, you wouldn't even know it failed potentially. And so by this, you're learning um, what the cost of that uh, potential implementation would be. Also, share the results. So it might not be valuable to you, but it might be more valuable to someone on the other side of the business. It might be someone valuable in the product team or further down in the marketing team who are working on a campaign who have a similar problem to solve. And if you share your results properly, then you can essentially share them, save them pain as well. Um, why do we do CRO? Because we want to understand the business impact. We want to innovate on user experience. Um, and on this point as well, what you guys will find is that we're all using phones day to day. We're all using good user experiences like LinkedIn, like Facebook, maybe, um, like uh, Instagram. People are used to high quality polished products, especially from the Silicon Valley companies. And if you're not keeping up with that trend and you're not innovating on your own piece of software, you will be left behind. And uh, the customers will come away with a worse experience like the Waitrose one. They're used to fantastically working um, experiences on their mobile. It didn't do that. And so they despised it and they said they wouldn't recommend it. Um, these are some patterns that work most of the time. Um, less form fields. Works great. More form fields. Um, what I say to you is, you need to understand when you're optimizing for leads, say for example, what is the quality of that lead with the extra information? Sometimes it's not just, oh, you need more of them. You might need to validate what you're actually getting from them more. So you might need a more qualified lead. Um, progressive fields, this is quite a nice one. So when people see a big chunk of fields, they despise it, they run away screaming. If you, it sounds a bit shady, but if you draw them in a little bit, ask them for one thing, getting smaller, yeah, getting much, Many smaller yeses is better than one big yes. Uh, removing guest codes, this is tried and tested. You pretty much do this on any e-commerce website and you do well. Um, what you find is that people, and you guys probably do the same, you see a gift code or a coupon code, the first thing someone will do is open a new tab and go, coupon code for this brand. Get rid of that, you remove that user behavior. USP bar, tell people why you're so great. It's quite common nowadays, but think about what exactly the benefits of going with you are, whether it's you know your high level of trust, your credibility, your price, that kind of thing. Display those to the user and put them across the entire website so that they're constantly reminded of what the benefits of purchasing with you are. Personalization, people love being talked to. Um, it's quite sounds quite simple, but it can be super complex. So it might be um, we well, have taken their name and so we can say, hello, Marcus. But it might also be, it's raining where you are. So let's show you raincoats. Um, it can be quite varied, and it's a super powerful tool. And again, you can probably give about 16 different talks just on that subject alone. Um, you want more? GoodUI.org is a fantastic repository. Uh, they have those patterns you saw there, but they actually have um, results of people testing these things on various different verticals. And so you can say, um, conclusively, this pattern has an X percent upward across 100 different times they've implemented it. Um, so in the summary is, know who users are, find out what the problems they have, test your fixes, learn, and then share your results around the business. Thank you very much. Again, sorry, shameless self-plug, free detailed audit, come have a chat. Any questions?
think the box is coming. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, be careful, they're about to throw. <laughs> Behind you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you had mentioned that, uh, can you elaborate a little more about when you said um, negative experiences tend to have a greater impact than uh, positive experiences? Mm -hmm. You said something about that in your slide? Yeah, so okay. it's called negativity bias. I recommend, um, there's lots of different biases out there. Um, we like to look at different psychological factors in play when we're designing for user experiences, things like choice paralysis. Um, for example, recently we had a test with P&L Cruises and they want to essentially show all their product range at once to their you know, loyal users. If you do that for some segment of the user base, they'll be confused because they don't know what you're offering. They just have prices. Uh, it's all confusing. They prefer a more handheld approach. And so when we're essentially looking at these things, we need to understand all the various different aspects of the psychological um, behavior at play to make sure that we design a proper experience for it. And so like the negativity bias, for example, um, one of the ways that we do that is we need to make sure that we fix, like I said, the JavaScript errors initially, because if someone has a problem on your website, it'll be vastly outweighed by any good that you can do. And so make sure that you're essentially bringing yourself up to par before you start working on the shiny, polishy stuff first. Does that help? Okay. Making him run. Ah, good catch. Um, so you, you, you walked through a bunch of stuff, um, and some of it was a, maybe a little bit more intense than others in terms of like the analysis <laughs> and stuff like that. Do, do clients, um, um, I guess there's, it's sort of a two-part question. Number one is, do clients sort of buy that end-to-end -end, like all the way from research through the execution of tests and the results? Um, and if so, or if, if, not, if not, or regardless of the question, I guess, or the answer to that question, but like, can they buy like just pieces of that, of that process, or do they have to buy sort of end to end? Like, yeah. let's start with the research, the qualitative and quantitative, and then work our way through the hypothesis and execution. So, in the past, I've been very flexible how we work with clients, especially when you have large enterprise customers come to you. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll do whatever you want, um, and that is a bit in the ass um, because if you don't do uh, so, like. Let's take the biometrics, so for example, that's optional as far as I'm concerned. It's nice to have, you have a credibility in the data there that works for big people, but when you're doing like technical uh, audits for analytics tracking and things like that, if you don't do that and you engage in a CRO program, you get to the point where you go, oh, I can't do this test because I'm not tracking the body output of that button. And so there are certain behaviors and um, like reports that you should happen before you start to engage in these things, even if it's a case of, okay, so, um, What's the, like general project management stuff? What's the racy, right? Who's responsible? Who wants to be informed of these things? So you don't put a test live and then you have the call center ring up and go, oh, the website is looking blue for some reason. I think it's broke for me. Um, and so it does, there are certain things that you can pick and choose, but for me, there is a, there's a core set of services that I didn't really touch on there because of the boring stuff um, that you need to do when you onboard a new client. But the, the UX biometric stuff is optional. When we have clients, um, often we we'll use, we'll use that initially and we say, this is what we do. Um, and then people take on the CRO stuff afterwards. But recently with uh, P&L Cruises, so for example, they've engaged us for CRO work. And then out the back of that, they're asking about UX research as well. And so it is more pick and choose. But I like to do the process end to end because it gives us the credibility of the data. And otherwise, you can't be sure, you can't be as sure, I guess, whether or not you prioritize the right thing. Does that help? Well, I think we're done. We're done. Good man. Thank you, guys. Yeah.